Now I'll be honest, when I was competing, my focus was generally on my training sessions and how the consistency of those might impact on my race day performance. I never considered how varying my training intensities coupled with my diet might actually have a real impact on the fuel I was utilizing in my body. So asking myself if a fat burning zone existed or if I should become better at learning how to be fat adapted, these weren't things I ever questioned. Did it matter where these things impacted us as triathletes? I knew very little about this subject. So to expand my horizons, I've spoken to two experts in the field of sports nutrition and sports science who view this from slightly different sides of the fence. Dietitian Rini McGregor erred on the side of caution, whereas physiologist Dan Plews brought a wealth of knowledge about how becoming fat adapted can improve our performances as triathletes. Now, although I've got limited knowledge on this subject, my general understanding of how the body works is that carbohydrates are our go-to source of fuel for us since they're more readily available. Even though there are relatively unlimited stores of fats in the body, they're just harder to access. So if we were able to tap into these fat stores, it'd be particularly useful for an endurance sport like triathlon. If only we could teach the body to oxidize or burn these fats rather than those internal carbs that we have, which are known as endogenous carbs, but we'll get to those in a little bit later. So to get started, I asked both of the experts if a fat burning zone does exist. And firstly, Rini reminded me of the complexities of the body and how a particular number is rather hard to talk about. So hello Rini, thanks so much for taking time to speak to us today about um, the fat burning zone or perhaps the myths around the fat burning zone because I'll be honest it's something that I don't really know very much about either so I wondered if you could start off by talking to me about the concept of whether this type of zone actually exists. Of course yeah and uh, thanks for having me Fraser. Um... So it's, it's a complicated thing because obviously the body is not exactly simple. Um, and I think as with a lot of things in science, and I'm definitely thinking in sports science, we we try and simplify it mainly because we want to try and explain it to people. So it's not, it's not a case of um, we don't know, we just try and simplify it so that people get a better understanding, I guess. And what we do know is, you know, obviously a lot of people do those... Um, lactate threshold tests, those VO2 max tests to try and find out like their, their their training zones and things like that. So that's a good place to start. Like those tests are legitimate and they are very, very good and they're very helpful. Um, if they are done well, um, in in the sense that they're done in a lab and you've got the right mouthpieces and you've got all the, all the technical data and you're wearing, um, ideally you want to be wearing a, a mouthpiece so you can be measuring what we call respiratory quotient, which tells you what you're burning in terms of what fuel you're burning. And if you look at data on this, you will generally see that the lower the intensity of your training, so when you're first starting out in those, those step tests or lactate threshold tests, you will be burning a much higher percentage of fat because the body um, doesn't need um, energy as quickly as such so that the fat that's within the muscle will be getting broken down and being used and and you know you'll be using more fat for fuel but where that number sits is really individual so i think where the complications come in is that we have standardized it and said like everybody's in the fat burning zone when you work at six out of ten or sixty percent of your heart rate and of course we're all individual and our physiology is different and what that hasn't necessarily taken into account is genetics lifestyle um training training age as well which is which is huge um your gender men and women are going to be very very different right so that's the bit that i want people to understand is that there's no absolute number as such what has dan highlighted that by using that laboratory environment they can create conditions to find that optimum fat burning or metabolizing zone but the realities of day-to-day -day real life means it's not easy to be precise Right, Dan, thanks very much for um, spending some time with us to talk about something that I am actually quite a 
I should say novice in terms of, and that is fat burning. And essentially, my first question is, what are your thoughts on there being what we might call a fat burning zone? Yeah, I guess the fat burning zone is something that's talked about quite a lot within the triathlon community. And there is a zone where fat burning takes place. So we know that generally the maximal fat burning takes place at the top of the aerobic threshold or VT1 as you like. So around that 70% of VO2 max. But where it is in terms of a pinpoint accuracy, that can actually change on a day-to-day -day basis. So although there is a rough zone to say that you're pinpointing it exactly on that point, say it might be 270 watts, for example, this is my fat burning zone. It could very much well change on a day-to-day -day basis. So what you're saying there is that athletes really would need to be quite aware of their, um, their changing routines from a day-to-day, -day, be, be that um, the training that they're doing, how they're feeling, diet, and all these types of factors. Yeah, exactly. So we, we can measure, what we, well, in the lab, we can measure two things that we're interested in when it comes to fat metabolism. So we measure maximal fat oxidation, which is basically your maximal rate of fat, so how much you can use fat as a fuel source. And then we also measure fat max, so we want to know where that actually applies in terms of power or running pace. So you could have a very, very high maximal fat oxidation, but if it, if it occurs at a range that's not around your race pace, for example, if you're interested in long distance triathlon, Ironman triathlon, it's not really that, that um, beneficial. So you want your maximal fat oxidation, so your maximal fat capacity occurring at around race pace. So they're the two things that we measure. But in the lab, we have to control things really, really tightly. So we'll control things like diet before, so which that can be actual habitual diet of how people generally on a day-to-day -day basis, but also what you're eating in the morning. So for example, when we're doing the tests, we'll make sure that we have to do them fasted every single time. So you can't have, um, so that kind of takes that away. So every time you're going out and you're doing exercise, for example, whether it be in the afternoon, in the morning or in the evening, because of that different timing of the day and what you've eaten just before it, that actual fat max zone will, will, will be different. That maybe means you wouldn't promote a specific optimal fat burning zone of, of a particular day or, or period in an athlete's training um, block, for example. It depends how much you want to pinpoint it and how accurate you want to be. You, what we do know is that when it comes to fat versus carbohydrate, for example, that, that type of substrate use, in most people, not in, not in every single person, but for most individuals, we see an increase in fat metabolism until the point of the aerobic threshold. And then from the aerobic to what's more commonly known as the anaerobic threshold, you see a gradual shift of carbohydrate oxidation until the point and where you get to your anaerobic threshold where you'll be pretty much 100% reliant on carbohydrates. So anything under VT1, anything under the aerobic threshold, you're pretty you are predominantly burning fat as a fuel. But like I said, that actual, where that actually is on a very precise level can change a little bit. But if you have a general level two aerobic training zone, you know that your fat, uh, maximal fat oxidation or your fat max is occurring somewhere within that range. And I would liken it just to as the same as when people are doing their FTP tests, they're trying to base their training zones off percentages, right? It's as much as a guess as that. That is still a guess, really. And um, but we're st everyone's still training in a zone. So it's that it's that kind of it's a you're trying to make an educated an educated estimation of where that might be by looking by having a proper level two training zone. Okay, so the ability to burn or oxidize fat can occur in a general zone, but Dan did also explain that the level of fitness that you have is directly associated with this too. And he also mentioned that there are other options such as adopting a high fat, low carb diet. No, there's there's many ways that you can do it. And the literature is quite strong. If you, if you look at the scientific literature, that's, it's quite strong that there are ways to increase your fat oxidation. I mean, the main way that most people increase their fat oxidation is the simply the fitter you are, the better your fat oxidation, because there's a really strong relationship between VO2 max and fat oxidation. VO2 max is related to more mitochondria in the muscle. For example, mitochondria is where beta oxidation and fat metabolism take place. So it takes place. So it makes sense that 
if you're fitter, you have a better fat oxidation. So like all the pro guys, regardless of what type of diet or structure they take, they will very likely have a good fat oxidation. But other ways are um, low carb diets have been shown to really improve fat oxidation. So restricting your um, restricting your carbohydrate use on a daily basis on more of a habitual level, but also what you eat prior. So fasted training can help improve your fat oxidation as well. So that happens in more of acute, an acute way. But then if you do it time and time again, it can also help with that too. Right then, so I'm starting to understand that this goal of being able to train the body to use fat as a fuel source, or fat adaptation as it's also known, does make sense, but it's not always plain sailing and can cause some health issues if it's not managed properly. And Rini was keen to point this out from her experiences of working with some athletes. Where it's also been misunderstood is that we, we got, a few years ago, we got this terminology of fat adaptation so people believing that they could train their body to use more fat for fuel thus sparing glycogen which would mean that they would then be able to go for a lot longer so particularly in endurance sport they'd be able to go a lot longer without needing carbohydrate um so we then got you know loads of people talking about low carb high fat and we had a load of endurance athletes doing low carb high fat and lo and behold some of them got some great results for the first six to 12 months and then a lot of them became injured, got um, depressed immune systems, went into overtraining, you know, got red S, like the system, the, the, the situation got on, went on because again, it was simplified. So fat adaptation is all about training. It's, it's how you train. It's not about your diet. So you don't need to take carbs out of your diet to, to become fat adapted. Indeed, I must admit, my own initial basic thoughts on this were that by targeting fat as a fuel source, that means that we need to limit or indeed cut out carbs from our diet. And Rini goes on to explain that this is a misunderstanding that often leads to and creates a fearfulness amongst athletes of carbohydrates. If you're going to do a lot of higher intensity work, you may need to up your carbs either side and also during. If you're doing a much more relaxed um, you know, or like a recovery ride or, or just a, a base ride or whatever you want to call it, or an easy run, easy long run, um, like I did yesterday, I still took carbs on before I went, I still took carbs during, but maybe I probably didn't take, I wouldn't have taken a really high dose because I wasn't really going that fast, mm. if that makes sense. So, but I kept on top of it. So it's it's really important to to understand that concept because I think still too many people get caught up in it and this is why we end up with so many athletes almost being fearful of carbs. However, Dan explains this needn't be the case because with a properly planned and integrated low carb, high fat diet, this can have a positive impact on an endurance event like an Ironman. Because by metabolizing or burning fats instead, that means that those precious internal endogenous carbs that I talked about earlier are preserved. And he gives a powerful example of that here. When it comes to long distance travel and performance, it's undeniable the the pres preservation of endogenous or internal carbohydrate stores, carb carbohydrate stores in the mus muscle are really, really important because that is a key determinant of the sport. When it comes to shorter events, maybe it's a 10 kilometer race or a 20 kilometer race walk, for example, probably not as much because you're not seeing the, it's not a key determinant of that event. Whereas when you're looking at events that are around eight hours plus, Preserving those endogenous carbohydrate stores are really, really critical. And a low low carb diet is one way that you can shift that your fat meta your um, your substrate use more towards fat at particular at particular work rate. So, so it is a, a really efficient way of allowing your body to be able to preserve what it has, and therefore you are going to be operating much better at that. Um, longer longer durations yeah so if you think about 270 watts for example if you ha if you can have 70 percent of your energy coming from fat at 270 watts rather than 30 percent of your energy coming from fat you're really preserving those endogenous carbohydrate stores but a, a male an average male of about you know 70 kilos will hold 800 grams of carbohydrates and those 800 grams are absolutely critical and it's 
I think it's often mis, mis, it's a bit confused where people think that we, we, we're saying the carbohydrates aren't important. Actually, it's the opposite. What I believe is carbohydrates are vital and really important. And that is why you have to train your fat metabolism to preserve them. So they're absolutely critical for overall performance. And that's why working on the other side of the coin, working on the fat metabolism to protect the endogenous carbohydrate stores all the way to the end of the race, will likely end up with a better result. So as I alluded to at the start of the video, I think it's clear that both of these experts do approach this from slightly different standpoints. And really it was at pains to remind me that the body is a complex thing. Sports science is brilliant, but we have to understand it's not just um, one dimensional. The human isn't one dimensional. The human is made up of, you know, an endocrine system, a biochemical system, a physiological system and a psychological system. And it's so important because these all interact together. And I think that's where a lot of stuff gets lost in translation. So, yeah, hopefully that's been helpful for people to understand and more people will eat cereal before they go out on their their rides or their runs. But nonetheless, it's been fascinating to dig a little bit deeper and with their expert help, have a bit of an investigation into fat burning and adaptation. But I think I'm starting to understand that it's not so much about a fat burning zone per se, but as Dan demonstrated, more being aware of how to better train our bodies to preserve those internal carb stores that we all possess. Now, I do appreciate that this is an extremely broad topic indeed, and I have barely even touched on the concept of fasted training. So there's lots of other things that you might want to chat about. So please drop them down in the comments below and we'll see if we can do some more videos in the future. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. So hit that thumb up like button and don't forget to follow us on our social media channels.